All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. If if your neighbor is is visiting, you may you may glance at them and um, I know. Uh, keep moving forward. We are glad that you are here, and we are talking about a topic today that could easily be an entire year, because we're talking about bioethics. This is the last Sunday to be on this fantastic book, unless we decide we need to have one more Sunday, which which we can do. Uh, but this is Francis Collins' book, The Language of God. Francis Collins led the Human Genome Project. He is a follower of, of Jesus, a disciple. Um, he also is the director of the National Institutes of Health. This is a 2006 book, but we have been studying this since uh, we started in August, right? Or was it September? Anyway, the beginning of, this, of the semester, uh, finding and learning about ways in which um, there are scientists and believers who see compatibility between the realms of science and faith, and specifically Christian faith following, following Jesus Christ. Um, and so um, I want to uh, pass around our attendance. Please make sure you, you sign up. I noticed that it's a new form today because <clears throat> we have our new church software called Realm that the church uh, jumped into. And did we get an email from Dave Moore? Did, Yes. I didn't actually get it. What did it say? Just hi from Sunday school? <laughs> oh, there's a test. What scripture did he give? It must have been the, the it's okay, you don't have to look it up. And he said something about the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, I didn't I didn't even tell him what the scripture was, but I'm glad that that gives us that chance. It's 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 I hope hopefully gonna be neat to you know, give all of us some more ability to communicate with each other. Our daughter Sarah was just asking about somebody's email and I said, I think I'll can log into Realm and you know be able to look that up. Um, but today we are talking about the appendix to this book, which is called The Moral Practice of Science and, and Bioethics. And by the way, I should have backed up. We're going to read from Philippians 2. So if you want to get your Bible ready, uh, we're going to read from this uh, time the, the NIV version. And we'll also read the message as well. So uh, Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 is our focus verse. You know... So I debated in, for four years in college. I can talk really fast. There's so much. We don't, we don't really, I don't think it's good to go fast. In fact, I think it's better to go slow. I think one of the things we need to do is have time to talk about these issues and to, and to not rush through them and to not emerge overwhelmed. Like it is so easy to be overwhelmed today with information, with technology, with so much. So... In red, it is all, it's been saying for a while, subject to change. Because even today, if we feel like we need another Sunday on this, hey, Dave Moore, is he can email our whole class, but he's not coming and telling us, you got to go to the next book, you know, on February 23rd. That is our thought, that we're going to be doing Richard Swenson's book, More Than Meets the Eye, and where Francis Collins is a geneticist. Um, Richard Swenson is a medical doctor. Francis Collins is as well, but um, his his professional career has been in genetics. On the 16th, Dave Moore is going to substitute, and we're going to have a, a guest speaker. And, and in between these, I want to squeeze in a, a, an opportunity to think about artificial intelligence and talk about that. So this is our plan, but we're going to kind of see how that goes. And I was thinking today, driving to, to church, we need to take a look at how many Sundays we have left, you know, through the end of May. Um, so if you want to pick that up in anticipation off of Amazon, the book is More Than Meets the Eye. This one I bought in paperback form. I've actually got this one in Kindle. You can get it either way. My dad listens to so many books now on Audible, and that's really a great way, and I think, I think it's available in all of those formats. So today I have a number of videos and, and articles we're not going to look at but I found them, you know, doing research and just, wow, these are really good. And so if you'd like to get those, there's a couple ways. Um, we have a Google Classroom. So if you take a picture of that code and you put that um, in, you do have to log in with a Google account that's probably not a work or a school account. It's a personal one. You can go to followjesus.westfire.com. I also share, among other things, pictures of our dog and 
ribs that I try to smoke in our backyard, uh, I end up posting those to Facebook as well. So our announcements, which I'll pass around, and then there's a sign-up sheet. The marriage retreat is next weekend, and you can still sign up today. I think today is officially the last day. But the sign-up sheet is to bring things like paper plates or napkins or Capri Suns or Oreo pins. And this is for the kids. So um, consider if you want to volunteer to just bring some items to help the kids and what they're going to be doing as we have the marriage retreat going on next weekend. Remind folks, if you um, you know have grandchildren, if you have chil- you know, children, if you've got friends who have preschool age, the ECP is doing priority enrollment for FPC families, and that starts on February 10th. And so that is that is awesome, and we're so you know thrilled that we have our wonderful early childhood program and that partnership. And you can get more information from Mary Singleton. Um, there's a Valentine's for Missions Evening Circle fundraiser, uh, and then there's also knitting and crochet lessons coming up. So lots of different opportunities to get involved in the life of the church. Uh, again, it'll be depending on what we want to do next week. We might want one more. <laughs> lesson to talk about what we're discussing today. Um, But this, has anybody besides me seen this yet, this two-hour special? This came out in November of 2019. It's on PBS Frontline. I'll admit to you, you know, my wife and I have different things we we enjoy. She has become basically a certified large and small animal vet watching Yukon (laughs) Vet and what's the new one? Dr. Pohl. Um, yeah, so if anybody needs an assistant for a small or large animal castration, um, she, can step, she can now step in after literally hours and hours of, you know, seeing what can go wrong. She's also decided we don't want large animals at our house some, at some point. Pigs, not really the cute things that we thought they were. Anyway, I like to watch documentaries, so Frontline is, you know, a series I just really like. And this special blew my mind. It's two hours long. I don't know if it'll happen, but I think I'm going to propose to Laura at the church because we'll go off our regular Sunday school cycle in in May about doing maybe a four-part thing in June on artificial intelligence and watching this and then talk about it. Watch a piece, let's talk about it. Watch a piece, let's talk about it. Folks are saying artificial intelligence already and is going to reshape just about every aspect of our lives, certainly medicine. And what we're talking about today with bioethics, with genetics, genetic engineering, body enhancements, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a wild world. It's also an exciting world, right? Healing, using technology to be able to extend life, being able to have medications that can absolutely change someone's life. Um, but there's other, you know, sides to this as well. So today we're going to um, open up with prayer. I've got a big question for us. We're going to read from Philippians 2. We're going to have chances to talk at our table, and we might watch part of a video. The video I have is 30 minutes long, and I know we're wa- not watching the whole thing. We may not even get to it. We may end up watching that next week. We're just going to kind of see how it goes. So, sonogram of Sarah Fryer, now age 19, right? She's going to be 20. She'll be 20. So, this was in May, 1st of May. Um, that would have been 20, that's 2000. She was. She and I were born on the decade. So, I was born in 70. My dad was born in 40. She was born in 2000. So, this is May of 2000. And this is her sonogram. This is waiting for her in Lubbock, Texas at 11.59 p.m. on June the 21st. And this is her right after she was born. That's Alexander, who's now a senior at the Colorado School of Mines. You still look like this, Shelly. Uh, great. She's off the air so much. <laughs> so we're going to be talking today, among other things, about our beliefs about when life begins. Uh, We're going to talk a little about in vitro fertilization, this idea of implanting an embryo that has had the sperm and the egg joined outside the body of the mother and then, you know, put in. And what are our thoughts about this? And just to go ahead and skip ahead, you know, Colin says, if you think this is simple, this is easy, like you're not either fully understanding it or just fully representing it because 
A lot of times people want to simplify things to just black and white. In fact, this whole class, part of this is saying, hey, it's not just simple, you know, in terms of science and evolution and creation and, and faith and, and Christ. Um, we have the bedrocks of our faith, and we, we read the Nicene Creed last week. We're going to keep going back to some of those eco-fundamentals of our faith. But there are, there's a lot of complexity, and, and there are decisions that we have to make. So let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll open up God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather in this place to open up your word, Lord, to open up this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians hundreds of years ago, Lord, and for us to discern how you are using it to speak to us today. God, you have called each one of us um, into the place where you have us right now in our families, in our relationships, in our work. God, you are at work, and I pray that you would open our eyes even wider to see you this day, to contemplate how you are calling us to serve one another, and Lord, how you would have us act and the choices you would have us make when we are faced with difficult circumstances, with with difficult challenges, God. Help us to be gentle with each other because, Lord, we we do disagree. We have different perspectives on things and uh, we have different understandings. Help us to come together and to, to agree on following your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, who we give you thanks for. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit would join us as we enter into conversations about things that can easily overwhelm us. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, let's open up our Bibles to Philippians 2. And as we do, there's a question I want you to think about today. Okay, and I'm going to give you some time. Because I'm not going to, I might, I don't know. We'll see how, if we, how much of the video we get to play. We might just, you know, start it. But I want us to talk about this particular question kind of at the end. And then now I'm going to give you like three minutes to talk about these verses But this big overarching question is, as followers of Jesus, how should we decide if and when genetic engineering, body enhancements are ethical? Are those things, you know, things that we we should do, that we should support? Um, You know, what do do we think about those things? So what do we know about the book of Philippians? Who wrote it? Paul, okay, apostle of, of Christ. <clears throat> he wrote it to the folks in Philippi, which is where? Where's Philippi? Is it Greece? Greece? Like Greece, but kind of between Greece and Turkey. Oh, it's sort of like the, the, uh, the Aegean Sea separates Greece from Anatolia, which is modern day Turkey, and then Philippi was up there. And so, uh, why did he write the letter? Encourage, help uh, clarify help direct um, the, the, the early Christians in Philippi. And, uh, of course, Paul wrote a, a large portion of the New Testament. His letters are one of the most important guidelines and guideposts that we have to understanding the commission that we have to share Jesus and to know Jesus. So this is from the NIV version, Philippians 2, verse, verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another... Have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that is the NIV version of Philippians 2, 5 through 11. I found some different pictures. I don't know if you've explored this, but... Google has an amazing collection just called Google Arts and Culture. So you can search in Google, Google Arts and Culture Jesus, and like this was from an article where they had, uh, this was from the Renaissance, different Renaissance depictions of Jesus, understandings of him. So I'd like to also read the same verses, but this time this is from 
the message, which is in more contemporary language. It's the same words. What, what did uh, Paul write in? Do you remember his language? Greek. Greek? Anybody here speak Greek? Dave's gone. Okay, we've got our Greek, Greek speaker is not here. So language is approximating ideas, right? And when we come to something like God and his omniscience and omnipotence, I mean, we're always going to fall short of completely understanding and completely representing. But the different versions of the Bible that we have can help us to understand in our you know, feeble, small minds these big ideas. So this is from the message, Philippians 2. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever. So that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried will bow and worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. So I'd like you to take three minutes and I'd like you to talk at your table about this question. If we have this mindset that Paul is talking about in these verses, how should that affect how we live our lives? Okay. Talk at your table about that for three minutes, please. Let's, uh, this is called a turn, pair, and share. You have shared with your neighbors a little bit. Um, what are some things that we talked about? How, how should this mindset affect how we live our lives? I'll write down a couple things I heard at our table. I heard humility. Um, what else did we say? Not about me. Not about me. Um, we talked about, um, you know, who who we worship and, you know, altars because we can put technology, we can put ourselves, we can put all kinds of things, our children even, right? We can put them on the altar and, and worship them to the extent that we don't worship the Lord. What else do we talk about or anybody? Well, this is about not about me, but um, selfless, not selfish. <laughs> selfless, right? We could write. We could write the word selfish, and we could put a big X through it. Right? <laughs> We're not supposed to let our inner two-year-old take over our <laughs> lives. Being a servant. Yes, absolutely. I love to hear the words of Dr. King. What he talks about <clears throat> being a servant. Have you guys heard that one? I'll have to play that one sometime. I mean, when he, he says, you don't need a college degree to serve. You know, I can't do it. <laughs> it's awesome, you know, because he's like, let's just lo- let's get humble and say no matter how much college you've been to, no matter how fancy a house you live in, no matter who your granddaddy was, you know, we can all serve. And that's what we're called to do. We're not called to elevate ourselves. We're called to serve, to be a servant. What else? Dave well, talked. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, girl. Uh, Dave talked about you know God placed Himself in Jesus and died and go through the suffering and resurrection and, and then we took that that big step. We take that big step. I mean, that's a big step out of Jesus. How do we take that big step ourselves? So die to self. Yet God, Jesus knew He would be resurrected. You know, and so die to self. We die to self. We take this outside the box, kind of outside our comfort zone, and then we know that we'll be blessed in some way as a result. I don't know if that's theology, though, that we'll be blessed. We may not be blessed, but it'll be better when we do 
Well, and we're going to be re we're, we're going to be reborn. This is the idea. We're going to be reborn. The seed, yeah. right? The seed uh, dies and it goes into the ground and it's reborn. And that's what you know with baptism and then coming into faith. We're we're reborn into Christ as new creations. Sometimes with different names, right? And that's all part of our our life here on earth as Christians that we're called to do. How do we do that, Barry? God gave us all special gifts, and we should use those. You know, it says, let your light shine before men. And so he expects us not to hide the gifts or covet the gifts or keep them in the music box if you've been to the pilgrimage, but to let them share all those gifts with other people. Absolutely. And I was thinking, not just to be a servant, but to be a slave. Yeah, that's some powerful language, right? Yeah. If we think about a slave, I mean that's you have no choice. You are, you're, but you're doing, but you're a willing slave. But you're, you're saying, Lord, you know better than I. You know, if you've placed me here in this spot to, to be here, then you've got a purpose, and I want to find what that purpose is, and I want to, I want to live into that. Was something else that stood out to me was the part in verse three where it says, again, we talked about selfish ambition, but it says, or vain conceit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me that is... Say, what would you say before conceit? Well, it's a selfish vain. ambition or vain, vain, vain conceit. conceit. Right. You know, um, trying to get credit for something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the world says that's what we should aspire to do. Now, if your name is on a building, please don't <laughs> forever not come back to our Sunday school class because Wes said this. But sometimes when I see folks' names on buildings, and, and it, it is wonderful to donate to things. We were positive tomorrow's yesterday, and there's all these different rooms and the donors and all that, and that is fantastic. Uh, but we also need to be thinking about how are we called to give, how are we called to serve, and we certainly you know, are not called to elevate ourselves and put, you know, put ourselves up there and, you know. So there's something to be said for anonymous giving. There's something to be said for, you know, praying in our in our closets or praying in our, you know quietly, not being the ostentatious Pharisee who's on the corner seeking glory, you know, versus seeking to bring others to Christ. Okay, let's talk about genetic engineering, shall we? Jump <laughs> into <laughs> this uh, topic. Uh, so genetic engineering is a reality. We talked at the beginning of our class about CRISPR, okay? This technology that lets us now snip parts of the DNA code, and uh, there can be you know repairs made and changes made, um, conditions like cystic fibrosis and other things that are genetic mutations. Because actually, you know, most mutations of the genetic code don't work out really well. For the organism, you know, whether it's human or, or animal or, or, or something else. So genetic engineering is the direct manipulation of an organism's genes using biotechnology. It is a change in the genetic makeup of cells. And if you change the genetics, is that just for that one person? If they don't have any kids, yes. But if they have children, what happens? It's yeah, progeny, right? It's continued on. So when we think about making changes to genetics, that's that's a pretty big deal. Um, this is from the English Wikipedia, but if you if you look, at, they have a whole series on genetics, and they've got different thirteen different subcategories. And this tells you how many pages today, or like last last week, there are about cloning uh, opponents of genetic engineering, the genomes that have been sequenced, right? The thing that Francis Collins led, the Human Genome Project, meant the sequencing of our genome. Six billion base pairs, three million, or sorry, yeah, three million from mom, three million from dad. And in the book, they, they cite that there's about 30 mutations usually each person has, but that's a lot. Six billion base pairs. So we have genetic, oops, my phone got off. Genetic modification, we have a genetic modification, but we've also got something called, um, you know, selective breeding, right? And just, how about plants? Why not have a picture of what's supposed to be a broccoli? Do you know that? Is broccoli something that, you know, Adam and Eve were plucking out of the garden? No, because where did it come from? 
it came from a cabbage that was modified by people. And, you know, how about golden retrievers? They running around with Cain and Abel? No, <laughs> they were not. You know, their ancestors of all dogs, we understand, were wolves, right? And so I guess some of them came into the, closer to the fire and wanted some meat and, you know, showed a little more friendly tendency. And so, you know, over time, and it really wasn't that long of time. Anybody uh, know about, you've, you've watched a lot of dog shows, right? Yeah. <laughs> how many, I wonder, how many years did it take, right, for the, the number of dog species that we have? I mean, it's incredible and in how different they are, right? I don't know what your favorite dog breed is, but, like, there's real big differences in the just innate characteristics of different breeds. So we have genetic modification. I didn't put this article in, but they've been, they're actually working to, on, on some mosquitoes in South America to make a genetic modification that will prevent their breeding. But can anybody think about the food chain? And what, what can happen when we like, oh, let me... Let me just take this out. Bats run out of stuff to eat. Right. There's a cycle of life. There's a lot of complex food chains. And so when we think about doing something, not just as a one-off on these particular organisms, but genetically, whoo, there can be cascading effects. Now, I'm glad that, that the unintended consequences, whether it's mosquitoes or people, I think that's the, we don't know. A uh, hundred years ago, we didn't know. Two hundred years ago, we didn't know. Well, we don't know today. What What are the consequences? Right. Um, but it's easy to get a little high and mighty about it. So, yeah. So rather than just try and just take it in. And right. Do we need to slow down a little bit? Yeah. or Because the capability we have is far beyond, you know, broccoli and golden retrievers. Like, what we can do now, or starting to be able to do now with genetics, is just crazy. And then there's there's the whole thing of implants. Okay, and by implants, I'm not just talking about augmentation of body parts that are visible. I'm also talking about implanting technology, implanting um, things that, well, they, they could be prosthetic, right? They could be, um, you know, some kind of a, of a technology that allows you to sense. It's, there's a wide gamut of this. So, yes, the first broccoli. Broccoli is a... years ago, we had the uh, $6 million dollars. That's right. And then the bionic Steve woman as well, right? You remember his name? What was that guy? Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Who can, who could, who can. was actually Lee Majors, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And thinking, th yeah, who could think, I should have that as a little audio clip that we could have right now. But, I mean, we have bionic people today, right? But do you allow them to compete in the Olympics? Do we have a separate Olympics for them? How does that all work? Okay. So. I want to mention this book. Uh, this is a one that I actually listened to by Alec Ross. It's called The Industries of the Future. And Ross was the senior advisor for innovation to Hillary Clinton when she was the Secretary of State. So irrespective of your opinions of Secretary Clinton, which I'm sure we have lots of opinions about. Um, this guy, which is he's a year younger than I, uh, Man, he has seen some incredible things around the whole world with respect to technology and innovation. And so he says there are three fields that are going to be super huge in shaping our future. Robotics and artificial intelligence, cybercrime and cybersecurity, and then the commercialization of genomics. Okay, Who is going to get to genetically modify their children? Is it going to be only the wealthy? and the rich? Is it going to be something that's accessible to all? Or is it going to be something that will be regulated and so maybe we don't you know, genetically modify uh, people? But how do we make that decision? Like where, where do we draw a line? And so I'm not gonna play this video, but this is about a four minute video where he talks about um, the benefits of this kind of modification in terms of healing, in terms of health and what um, the positives can be. Um, this is another video I ran across, which is by uh, the PBS special, OK to be Smart, and it talks about CRISPR and the future of human evolution. We've talked about this before, but you know, if you can choose things about your children or even about yourself, like 
where does it become not right to do? Or is there a place at which it becomes not right to do? Who's done a DNA test of yourself? Anybody done? Okay, a couple of us. 23andMe, Ancestry DNA. Um, why have you chosen to do that or not chosen to do that? It's called curiosity. Curiosity, all right. My sister, who was adopted, was curious about her birth mother. And lo and behold, her birth mother, about a year before, she, uh, did she do 23 Me? I think? I think that was the one that she did, had done her test. And so about a year ago, my sister Trudy, who was born in 1977, met her birth mother for the first time because they connected. And um, that was her curiosity. But... And it's turned out well. Yeah, it's turned out well. And there's also sometimes curiosity about health, right? Do we have a history of cancer? Do we have a history of fill in the blank, you know? Um, For those of us that haven't done that, and I haven't done that, what are the reasons you haven't done that? I don't trust the privacy part of it. Ah, privacy. I don't care myself. Right. When that information is out there, who's going to get it? Because once the data is out there, it doesn't matter who has it. It can be hacked. Okay, the database can be hacked. So what happens to the information when it's out there? Will that be used by insurance companies? Will that be used by, you know, others? What what's it going to be used by? Um, any other reasons, I'm folks? Cheap. Okay, <laughs> and it and it's been pretty expensive. Twenty three and Me has a ninety nine dollar test now to find out your geographic roots, and then you can you know scale up, I guess, beyond that. But that's one of the things. This is a two thousand six book, right? We're in 2020, 14 years. A heck of a lot has happened in 14 years. I don't think we're going to get to our video at all today, which is fine. Um, But what I'm going to do is kind of summarize from the chapter some of what Callan's comments about these topics, um, and then we'll have a little bit of talk time perhaps before we do our joys and concerns. Colin says that knowledge itself has no intrinsic moral value. It's the way in which that knowledge is put to use that acquires an ethical dimension. I mean, when we talk about genetics and genomics, we can also think about Nazi Germany. We can think about this idea of a super race and people who in parts of time, I think maybe Lindbergh even was like in favor of, you know, making sure that the race was pure and that, you know, certain people lived and certain people didn't. Here's what Collins said on page 242. The weight of evidence suggests that legislative protection ought to be provided against genetic discrimination, what you were just saying here, insurance, in health insurance in the workplace. At this writing, however, and I miss my eye, we still await the implementation of effective legislation at the federal level in the United States. And unless I'm mistaken, I still don't think we have that 14 years later. Okay? And so... Do we need regulation to be able to protect? We have consumer protection in a lot of different areas. This is an area we still don't have legislation on. Who's heard of Dolly the sheep? Okay. So Collins talks about Dolly. And why was Dolly a controversial sheep when she was born? She was a clone. She was a clone. And so this was a case of taking, you know, sperm and egg and using a process called nuclear transfer, this was in 1996 in Scotland, England, Scotland, UK, um, to create a clone. Well, at this time, this was written. Had we had human cloning, has anybody done it? Not that we has it been done now? Not that we know. Yes. Yes, it has. So this is from the Independent in China, November 2018, world's first genetically altered babies born in China. Now, this is also really interesting how this guy disappeared. He was supposed to present at a conference, and then, whoa, he just, I don't think we know where he is in China. Um, The research was considered to be illegal in most countries. They altered the embryos of seven couples undergoing fertility treatment. So this is something we also sometimes see with technology is, you know, no matter what we're thinking or regulating, there are folks who are going to push those boundaries. But should they? And should we have regulation and regimes that try to limit it, right? Chemical weapons. I mean, there's some people that say, we shouldn't have any restrictions to war. Let's just do whatever we want. Well, have you heard of chemical weapons? Have you studied World War II? Do you know why mustard gas is illegal? You know, can anyone in a lab create poisonous gases? 
if they have the ingredients, they can. But there are things that we try to regulate in order to protect horrors from, you know, being unleashed on the world. All right. I'm going to talk like I know what I'm saying, and I just <laughs> stay at a Holiday Inn Express, you know, every couple months or whatever. Every, every Twice a year, I stay at Holiday Inn Express. Somatic cell nuclear transfer. In genetics and developmental biology, somatic cell nuclear transfer, SCNT, is a lab strategy for creating a viable embryo from body, cell, and egg cell. And let me just say this. Let's think about the question of when life begins, okay? And a soul. When is the soul there and, in, and to what degree should we be putting our hands into that, the processes which can just be natural okay? and I didn't grow up Catholic but I think the Catholic understanding of birth control is still what? Official is, is, is birth control legit? Is birth control okay? I don't think for Catholics I don't think it is what's the thinking there? You have to let the natural process take place. And if you're using birth control, you're getting in the way of the Lord, right? Well, that is not my view. Uh, what happens if you just totally reject birth control in your society? You have a lot of babies and you have large families. And at one point, when we were more agrarian and you know society was different, I mean, who, who has the most siblings in our room? Does anybody have more than four Brothers and sisters in your family? Really? Okay. I do have four. But do you have four? Okay. But I mean, it wouldn't be uncommon if we were to go back a generation to have folks that had, you know, five, maybe yeah, even ten. Mortality was really high. It too. was, absolutely. And what reduced that medicine, <laughs> technology, you know, advanced. I mean, yeah, we had like ten yeah. in my dad's the, the South Dakota tree farm, the whole the brothers and sisters from there. Okay, so Dolly the sheep was the first successful case of using this cloning process. So here's what Collins says on page 250, talking about the start of life. For centuries, different definitions of the beginning of life have been offered by different cultures and faith traditions. Even today, different faiths use different milestones to mark the entrance of the soul into the human fetus. From a biologist's perspective, the steps that follow the union of sperm and egg occur in a highly predictable order, leading to increased complexity and with no sharp boundaries between phases. There is, therefore, no convenient biological dividing line between a human being and an embryonic form that might be called not quite there yet. So, in vitro fertilization, do any of us know someone who has um, had a child because of in vitro fertilization? Why do people have in vitro fertilization? Because they're unfertile. They're not able to naturally conceive, right? They've tried, probably a lot, and they have not been able to. And so what is our understanding of that process? Sperm and egg are taken from mom and dad. They are joined, and one or more viable embryos are then implanted in the mother. Is this used with animals? Yeah, it is. And it's been used uh, with humans as well. And so um, this is what Colin says. In most instances, talking about in vitro fertilization, there are more embryos available than can be safely implanted. The spare embryos are often frozen. In the United States alone, there are hundreds of thousands of such frozen embryos. And remember, what is an embryo? Egg. It is a fertilized egg. Sperm and egg have come together and started the process of life. But has that egg been implanted yet in this process? Not when they're frozen like that. They're, they've been brought together outside the body of the mom, and they're waiting for use if they would want it to be used. So in the United States alone, there's hundreds of thousands of such frozen embryos currently stored in freezers, and that number continues to grow. 2006, 14 years later, I don't know that number. How many frozen embryos are there in the United States alone? A lot. While actual adoption of these embryos by other couples has resulted in a small number of them giving rise to pregnancies, there is no question that the vast majority of these embryos will ultimately be discarded. So I just took a picture of this rather than try to type it, but that, this is on page 256. Um, and this is his view, right? And remember, I'm not totally agreeing with everything he says. Just because we're studying this book doesn't mean, you know, Wes or anybody else says, hey, he has truth, right? That's why we start with the Bible. We're going to start with God's word, and we're going to use this as a lens to try to interpret these issues. 
But this is what pollen says. I would argue the immediate product of a skin cell and an enucleated egg cell fall far short of the moral status of the union of sperm and egg. And this, and this is where he's talking about stem cells. The former is a creation in the laboratory that does not occur in nature, not part of God's plan to create a human individual. The latter is very much part of God's plan carried out through millennia by our own species and many others. He says, like virtually everyone else, I am strongly opposed to the idea of human reproductive cloning. Implanting the product of a human SN, SCNT, that's the dolly, um, the sheep process, into a uterus is profoundly immoral and ought to be opposed on the strongest possible grounds. Do we have any regulation today preventing that in the United States? Yes, we do, don't we? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Or maybe, I just know that the, the scientific community... When, when China announced yeah. that they'd done that, yeah. they just... It was an uproar. We're way behind. It was an we're uproar. Gonna get, we're going to fall behind. I mean, well, so but I there's... Know, that's a difference between... I don't know if there's a law or yeah. regulation. I need to do... We, need, we can do some more research on that. We know the scientific... There's parts of the scientific community that say, well, why are, why are they going ahead and doing this? And we're not moving forward. But there's also folks like Collins who are like, no, that's a bright line. You know, let's not do that with human beings. Um... He says, if such steps can result in tissue match cells that cure juvenile diabetes, why would that not be a morally acceptable procedure? Um, and I'm not going to be representing this fully because, like, hey, I'm not a doctor, and I'm, you know, I took my last science class in probably 19, you know, 92. Um, stem cells. I had the idea, and this helped me kind of shift that a little bit, that all stem cells came from aborted fetuses. Okay, and that was part of the reason to oppose abortion was because of that stem cell. There's different places where stem cells come. And stem cells, as I understand it, you know, it, it's really early in the process. They can become any other kind of cell. That's one of the reasons why they're so amazing in terms of the, the capability. You can get them from the, where the mother is connected to the baby. I mean, that's why a lot of people now keep the cord. Mm -hmm. um, the umbilical cord. The uh, umbilical cord. Right. And have that the even core frozen. blood. And they're using, there is a, sorry, there is a doctor here um, who is collecting stem cells and babies with heart defects. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Burkhart, who is a, a pediatric heart surgeon, who just recently, within the month, has taken those stem cells and injected them into the heart of the baby in order to get the, the other side of the heart to grow normally. So this is another aspect of this, this is the use of stem like cells, the harvesting of stem cells. Where do they come from? And he's saying, this is going to move rapidly. If we would oppose all research of this kind, he says, opposing all research of this kind, stem cell research, means the ethical mandate to alleviate suffering has been trumped absolutely by other perceived moral obligations. Um, and I like this quote. This is from 257. He says, anyone who portrays this issue as a simple battle between belief and atheism does a disservice to the complexities of the, of the issues. Um, and <laughs> I, th this is my favorite quote from the whole chapter. There's a 2004 book called The God Gene, and this was a book basically saying, hey, if you believe in God, that's just because you got that gene. You know, it, it's not because it's anything real. That's just your DNA. Okay, here's what Colin cites another uh, scientist saying. They really should have called this the whole title of the book, a gene that accounts for less than 1% of the variants found in scores on psychological questionnaires designed to measure a factor called self-transcendence, which can signify everything from belonging to the Green Party to believing in ESP, according to one unpublished, unreplicated study. <laughs> Let's be very careful whenever people say science tells us. One of my favorite books by Neil Postman is called Technopoly, which is about the worship of science and statistics and graphs. One of the things you learn getting a doctorate is, how do you analyze the study? How many people were in there? Was it a random sample? You know, there's all these questions when somebody says, well, we found out. So that is certainly not conclusive, okay? Dean Hamer made a lot of headlines in 2004 writing that book, but no one else, I don't think, has replicated the survey. And Anyway, so what constitutes an enhancement of our bodies? Who's had the flu this year? Anybody? Anybody have been sick with it? I, I met a friend this week who's had both, the A and the B, okay? And when he was talking to his doctor, this was the statistic, about 60,000 people annually die. Die. And his doctor said 92% of them are not immunized. Okay, Colin says 
on two, page 265. And immunization is most definitely an enhancement. It leads to the proliferation of certain clone cells, of immune cells, even rearrangements of DNA. So, like, it's not just for that person, if they, again, have children, that can affect the genome. Uh, anybody in favor of some immunizations? You know, that, that's been a big deal, right? The anti-vaxxers, we've got resurgence of different kinds of, of viruses and, and our, yeah, different kinds of diseases, you know, as a result of anti-voxing. How about coronavirus? Anybody want to go with me to, what's the name of the Chinese city that's shut down? Wuhan, anybody want to go fly to Wuhan? Oh, we can. Oh, there's only a few people there, right? 11 million people? So current events... Um, how do we how do we deal with these things? How about doping? All right, is this an issue? Oh yeah, this is the New York Times on February first, yesterday, talking about the Russian perception of doping and what we should be allowed to do or not to do. You know, enhancing our bodies. Um, so there's more in terms of implants. People implanting now chips and even computers, biohackers under their skin. Uh, this is from 2016, but this is a fantastic, this is a great video. I talked with a real life cyborg, now I'm convinced cyborgism is the future. That is not a camera. This is a man who was born colorblind, and so he has had this implanted into his brain where it actually perceives colors, but it shares them with his brain as sounds, and he is able to perceive color in the world because of this antenna which is implanted into his cranium. He cannot take it out. He's had some trouble with Homeland Security and Customs. Seriously. <laughs> you know? And also just people. Like, what are you doing? He says people perceive it differently, you know, as time goes on. So Neuralink is Elon Musk's company that is working to have a neural connection so we can plug directly into our computer. The computer can plug directly into the brain stem. So here's what Francis Collins says. Let's admit enhancement is not an easy concept to define precisely. He talks about obesity. Somebody who is extremely overweight, we would probably agree, so important to help them find ways through medications and other treatments to reduce that obesity. But how about somebody who wants to become a supermodel or a parent who wants their child to become a supermodel? You know, is that something, you know, when do you cross the line as far as ethics? All right, so I have not left much time at all for questions. I think we're going to have to continue this next week. Uh, and so as we go into the week, let's think about this big question, how we should decide when and if these things are ethical. Uh, next week, I think we'll, we'll look at this video, um, which is called The Ethics of Gene Editing. And I'm just going to conclude with uh, the actual last paragraphs of the chapter, where Colin says this. Is the science of genetics and genomics beginning to allow us to, quote, play God? And I actually didn't title this, this lesson, Playing God. I called it Acting Like Jesus. Because there are ways in which we have God-like powers, right? God has given us responsibilities to steward the earth, not just to name the animals and the creatures of the earth, but to care for them. And so we have, I don't think that's a great way of saying it, because if somebody says, we shouldn't play God, I think that is really simplifying it, because there are ways in which we make choices that change our world. But I think a better question is, how do we act like Jesus, and so he says, the phrase is one of the most commonly used by those expressing concern about these advances, even when the speaker is a non-believer. <clears throat> Clearly the concern would be lessened if we could count on human beings to play God as God does, with infinite love and benevolence. Our track record is not so good. Difficult decisions arise when a conflict appears between the mandate to heal and the moral obligation to do no harm. But we have no alternative but to face these dilemmas head on, attempt to understand all the nuances, include the perspectives of all the stakeholders, and try to reach a consensus. The need to succeed at these endeavors is just one more compelling reason why the current battles between the scientific and spiritual worldviews need to be resolved. We desperately need both voices to be at the table and not to be shouting at each other. So, um, I do not left time today for joys and concerns. We will... Um, we'll start with joys and concerns next week. Um, I'd like to go ahead and close us in prayer, and then we'll, we'll head out. Dear God, there are a lot of challenging 
situations that we have in our world today. Um, but Lord, we know that there's also um, wonderful changes that have happened in, in healing and in medicine and in life expectancy and in many, many things. And so God, my prayer is that you would just open up our hearts uh, to your word and to your son Jesus because, Lord, we're not going to have answers to all of these questions or other questions, but we know that we, we do find our purpose and we do find our truth in you and in your son, Jesus. And so, God, I pray as we walk out of this room today into our lives outside of church that you would walk with us, that you would open our eyes to the opportunities we have to, to have conversations with others, to show your love, and to be the hands and feet of Jesus with everyone and with whom we come in contact in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. I think we'll do one more week, so we'll, we'll continue this next week.